it is to you this morning that we turn and ask you to please bring your healing power into the life lives of Susan Zimmerman and Paula, two parishioners who are so faithful in the service of this community. May their suffering truly be seen as an avenue toward coming to find you. And may our prayers and the love of all those who call them and visit them strengthen them in this journey toward healing. Mary, our mother, hold them in the mantle of your love. Keep them close to the mercy of your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, um, I, I, I was so elated. You people are so lucky. You are so lucky that you have this young priest, Father Peter, and you also have this wonderful young man from your own community who is going to be studying for the, this diocese, but is beginning his studies, was accepted, and is beginning his studies at Providence um, College or University in Rhode Island, which is the Dominicans. You can't get better teachers than the Dominicans. So, and he's such a nice young man. I met him last year, and I just met him now, Casey. So you, ha you should be very elated that a vocation has come forth and that God has sent another messenger to assist Father Allen in this uh, parish. You, you can only be grateful, really. That's, that's really what this day is about. I was thinking about, you know, it took me about two months before I adjusted and got all the rubrics correct for Mass as a young priest. So I could, I could sense his nervousness this morning. But I, for weeks, I forgot the Gloria, I forgot the Creed, and I thought I was going to hell. You know? <laughs> Thank God a parish priest was so nice. He said, Phil, God understands. <laughs> he understands. I, tell me if I told you this story, because I won't repeat it, but did I tell you? So I didn't have the experience that Father, and I was fortunate that Father Peter spent his year of diaconate here and a whole summer. So he was oriented into the parish life. And that's such a wonderful thing that you don't come in totally a stranger. But I came in to my first assignment in Spanish Harlem in New York City as a stranger, totally. I, I got ordained on a Saturday, and a week later I was stationed in a parish in Spanish Harlem. Now the story is my first mass for the parish. The, the pastor said to me, um, you're going to have the, the mass at 5 o'clock on Sunday, the 5 p.m. mass, it's the last mass. Well, I was a little disheartened by that because I thought, you know, it was like Jesus coming to his hometown that I'd have the first Mass and that the church would be packed with people. But to my surprise, um, when I came out to say the Mass in this church, St. Cecilia's, there were only about 10 people in church. <laughs> so my ego just plummeted. Well, here's what I saw. As I was coming down the side aisle, heading toward the center aisle, this church could hold about 700 people. There was a woman totally preoccupied. She was touching all the stations of the cross, so she had her own little ritual. So she totally ignored me. So I walked past her while she was kissing, kissing the first station. I get to the back of the church and there are two police officers in full uniform with cups of coffee. And they're leaning against the radiator and they're fulfilling their Sunday obligation, obviously, <laughs> while they're on duty. I come around to the center, and there's this chasm of nobody, except to my left, there's a man and a woman, an elderly man and a woman, with a dog in a bench, and the dog is wagging its tail in total delight, while they look, have no expression whatsoever on their face. At the very end, as I get up to the front, there are three women in the front bench. It's like the three faithful women in the gospel. Well, that was all I had to go with to preach my first homily. So I got up there to preach, and as I was preaching, I, the three faithful women were really paying attention. 
So they were feeding my fire, which helped, because everybody else was preoccupied. The woman was still touching stations. The, the, the police were drinking cups of coffee, and there was the dog in the bench wagging his head. We finished the homily, and the woman in the middle during the homily, toward the end of the homily, she looked like she was like totally filled with the spirit, because she was swaying back and forth. And when she stood to say the creed, she fell. She just disappeared in the bench. Well, I thought she fainted because she was so overcome by the homily. And to my surprise, the other two women dragged her, picked her up by the ankle and under the arms, and they pulled her into the sacristy. Then I knew something was wrong. Well, five minutes later, sure enough, the paramedics came down the aisle with people from the street to see what was going on. And they all rushed into the sacristy, and so did five of the other people that were in church doing nothing. So being a young priest, I had to say Mass. I had to do it. I couldn't leave the altar. So I was saying Mass, and at the end of Mass, I ran in there to see what was going on. And as I entered the sacristy, the woman's lying on the ground. The two paramedics are standing over her, and one of them is holding a tongue depressor. I have no idea what's happened. So I say to the paramedic, what happened? And he said in his New York accent, well... Father, she's a epileptic and she had a fit. Well, I started to laugh, not out loud. I started to laugh because all this time I thought she had fainted because of my humble. So they see me laughing. And they said, what's so funny? This isn't funny, Father. And I said, no, 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 I'm not laughing at her. I'm so embarrassed to tell you, but I have to tell you, otherwise you'll think worse of me. I said, I was laughing because I thought she fainted because of my homily. Well, with that, these two guys bursted out laughing. I mean, they were laughing so hard, one of them was leaning against the wall, coughing. Well, then I didn't think it was funny. So I said, what's so funny? And the guy who was trying to catch his breath says, Father, I don't want to burst your bubble, but she's also deaf. <laughs> So, my first homily, I realized that when people look like they're interested, most of you are deaf. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, the Zimmermans have asked me to speak to you about this wonderful sacrament of anointing, which has really become one of my favorite sacraments besides baptism and the Eucharist, but I just love the sacrament of the anointing and what it can do. So about three weeks ago I read an article by David Brooks in the New York Times which really um, affected me, but let me begin first with this gospel. This is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, I give you praise, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned, you have revealed them to the childlike. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and any when, anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you, rest, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So on March the 3rd, David Brooks of the New York Times wrote a column entitled, The Week That Awakened the World. The Week That Awakened the World. And writing about the Russian assault of the Ukraine as a moral atrocity and political tragedy, he also pointed out that for people around the world, this brutal attack had a cultural revelation. It, was a, it has awakened the world and its leaders to protest and action. And then he said, 
It's not that people around the world believe new things, but many of us have been reminded of what we believe and what we cherish most. And we believe it with more fervor and with more conviction today. I really believe that the sacrament of the anointing of the sick has a similar effect on anyone who receives it. It's not that we believe something new, but it reminds us of what we believe and it tells us to believe it, to believe in this sacrament with greater fervor and conviction. And what is that? What is it that we're being asked to believe? That our God has made us his holy and beloved ones. And that our God is with us with all the events of our lives, including those when sickness and illness and aging can make us fearful and even doubtful that God is around. We feel lonely and sad about what is happening to us. And I have come to treasure this sacrament for the great gift that it has always been. It has been with us since the early days of the church. In the Gospel of Mark, he refers to the sacrament when he recounts how Jesus sent out the twelve apostles to preach, and they cast out demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. In his epistle, James writes, Is there anyone among you who is sick? Let them call for the priests of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save that sick person and the Lord will raise them up. And if they have committed any sins, they will be forgiven. The Catholic tradition has always taken these words of Jesus seriously, making the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, believing that Christ is present and at work in those who receive the sacrament with faith and gathering the faithful, that's what's really important, when this sacrament is being celebrated to support those who are sick when their faith weakens. So the church sees the anointing of the sick as one of the very important components of caring for those who are ill. Because caring for the sick is a corporal work of mercy and it is part of the fundamental mission of the church. When you have people who are undergoing acute suffering, because of either illness or a disability. Instead of looking the other direction, we, the Catholic Christians, are called to confront that reality, to confront it, to embrace them, and to love them all the more in this situation of difficulty. What does that mean? That means, irregardless, whatever judgment you have about this person, at this point of suffering, you're called to embrace them and to love them all the more than what they're going through. Because often, and this is so true, often sickness makes somebody feel alienated from their family and friends and from the church and most especially even from God. It can be a very difficult and painful moment when someone feels utterly alone even if they're blessed to have a good support system. Anointing is one of the means by which the church tries to help people to be aware that the Lord is always present and the entire church is with them in thought and through this experience, this encounter with the cross. St. James says, or asks, is there anyone among you who is sick? Then he tells us, that those who are sick are candidates for anointing. Now notice that James does not ask, is anyone among you dying? He doesn't ask that. While we can and while we can and do anoint people who are dying, the proper candidates for this sacrament are all people who are sick, not just the dying. This sacrament began early in the church, in the early Christian community not as last rites, it wasn't last rites in the early church, but as something that addressed this very human experience. 
Everybody gets sick. Everybody suffers from illness or from some physical condition. Historically, the sacrament of anointing was in response to that. It was also a Christian call, and this is what we forget. It was a Christian call for the entire Christian community to pray. So that's why those who are sick in your community are brought to the altar at the prayer of the faithful. And you should remember them. What do we do when a brother or sister is suffering from illness or sickness? We gather. And what's so beautiful about this anointing, it's never meant, unless extreme cases, to be something you do alone. It isn't just the priest and the one who's sick. It should have other members of the family gathered around and participating, praying over them, and anointing this person with the oil of gladness. That's what the church's understanding was. When I went into the hospital so many times at Boston, Brigham and Women's, and also Denna Farber, I would go in and the family would be waiting for me, and they would expect me that I should just be there. I would say, don't any of you leave. And if anybody's in the family room, go and get them. Everyone should be here. Because the more of us that are here, the more this person will feel God's loving embrace. And then I would go so far as after I anointed them with the oil, after I finished the sacrament, I took this same oil and invited everyone in the family to anoint the body of the person they love. During the Middle Ages, this is when it changed. During the Middle Ages, it became common to anoint people only on their deathbeds. And that's why it was called extreme unction. Not extra unction, but extreme unction. Unction is an ointment. This is a special ointment, and it's only being used in extreme case. And this went on for a thousand years. Over a thousand years. It wasn't until Vatican II that there was a return to the more ancient understanding and the more ancient practice. Vatican II and extreme unction is more properly now called the anointing of the sick. And it pointed out that although it is certainly appropriate for those who are dying, people shouldn't wait until that point to receive the sacrament. Now, what's interesting is another word for someone who's dying and the priest who comes to bring them that sacrament is he gives them viaticum. Viaticum is the Latin word which means food for the way. That's what it means. Food for the way. So that's where you use the term viaticum, and only then. Now the rite doesn't identify in itself what the word seriously means. And I've been at masses where the anointing of the sick is included in the liturgy, which is fine. But I've heard presiders say, well, we're all suffering from someone, so everyone come up. <laughs> I don't think that's what the church envisions. If we take that approach, then I think we'll water down the sacrament. It's not for anyone who is just suffers from something. It's from someone who has an illness or a disability and is aged, that's also an important point. And aging is a disability. No. I mean, what about, I've lost my memory. Have you lost anything? <laughs> <laughs> so I have a wonderful mission team. And when we give a mission in a parish, we put out a brochure weeks before and hand it out to the entire parish of the whole week and what we're doing. And one of the things that we offer is the sacrament of the anointing. It's a liturgy that we offer. And it's really beautiful. What we do is we, we, first of all, in the bulletin itself or the brochure, we say we're offering. So please, if you wish to receive the sacrament, call the parish and sign up. And we will appoint you, we'll have a special seat for you in the <coughs> church with your caregiver being next to you and your family. So we really set this the space just for them. And secondly, we tell them what the sacrament is about and who it's for, so they have a clear understanding of what this sacrament is meant to be. And the response has been wonderful, just wonderful. We've anointed in most parishes between 100 and 150 people. 
And it's done so beautifully because the focus is on the sacrament. <coughs> and they feel its healing power. So this sacrament brings to those receiving three gifts. Three gifts in this sacrament. First, the Word of God. So essential to hear God first. Secondly, the two special moments of the sacrament. And thirdly, and just as important, is the presence of the community. The caregivers, the family, who's ever present there, even those who are sick. So while people are being anointed, we're inviting those who are there to be praying for these people. To seriously be praying. Because our prayers are powerful. and can add to the beauty of the sacrament. So first, the Word of God. Today, I read to you Matthew's Gospel. And Jesus blesses and thanks God for revealing what is hidden from the wise and revealing what is he wants them to know to little ones. And what is that? That God, our Father, has revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus, who knows the Father, has handed all things over to Jesus. And this Jesus reveals the Father to everyone whom Jesus chooses to be revealed to. And then Jesus says this beautiful statement. Come to me, all you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your shoulder and learn from me. So he is bearing the burden with you, and he's teaching you how to carry it. For I am gentle and humble of heart, and your souls will find rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What is the yoke? Well, take the message of the gospel Jesus preached. The kingdom of God, the presence of God is in your midst. With you now is Jesus. So Jesus is assuring you that he's always with you, especially now, yearning to help you bear this burden and to teach you how to bear, carry the yoke. So that's the first thing, the word of God. The second thing in the sacrament Every sacrament makes Christ present, brings us into contact with Jesus, the risen Lord. And Jesus is doing here what he did during his ministry. In Luke's gospel, we hear, as the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick, people with various diseases, brought them to Jesus. And he laid his hands on each one of them and cured them. This is what happens in the sacrament. Those who are sick come to Jesus and come to give them healing. You know, I was giving a, a retreat in a parish uh, several years ago, and there was a break, and we went upstairs to have lunch. And there was a lovely elderly woman who had been at the talk, and she was walking out the door. And so I said, oh, oh Martha, are you you're not going to stay for lunch? And she said, no. She said, I have an appointment with a um, masseuse today. And I said, oh, well, that's a lot better than, you know, sandwiches and chips. And she looked at me, and she said, Father, I have been a widow for 20 years, and no one touches me. This is my day to be touched. The two beautiful moments that are at the heart of the sacrament are the laying on of hands and the anointing with oil. And they are both moments of touch, of touch. The poet Marge Percy has a lovely poem called The Way of Touch, and it opens with these words. What magic does touch create that we crave it so? That babies do not thrive without it. That the nurse who cuts tough nails and sands calluses on the elderly tells me something sometimes men weep as she rubs lotion on their feet. She goes on more and then she concludes with these words. We touch each other in so many ways. In curiosity, in anger, to command attention, to soothe, to quiet, 
to rouse, to cure. Touch is our first language, and it's often our last. As the breath ebbs, and a hand closes our eyes. Almost all the sacraments that you receive involve touch. The anointings at baptism and confirmation, the laying on of hands at confirmation and ordination, the wedding couple touching each other's hands and professing their vows, the placing of the host in the palm of the hand of the recipient or on their tongue. So to this sacrament. Twice touch is experienced. I find gently laying my hands on a person's head for the anointing prior to using the oil just to let the Holy Spirit descend brings tears to so many people's eyes. And we're all invited to call on the Holy Spirit to come upon them and to breathe on them. Then after the prayer of the blessing, we do what the early church did. We anoint them. That's when we use the oil. The priest, he anoints first the forehead, and he says these words. Through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy strengthen you by the grace of the Holy Spirit. That's the first prayer. And we use oil. The oil of chrism. The oil with which you were baptized. The oil with which you were confirmed. And now the oil that is used to heal you and strengthen you. And then we ask the Lord to show his love and mercy by giving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we anoint your hands, each of your palms, because that's the center of touch. That's where you feel another person's touched the most. And we anoint it with a cross and we say, May the Lord who frees you from your sin save you and raise you up. Those simple words are the sacrament of penance. You have been forgiven your sins. And the last gift, as I mentioned, is the gathering of the community. To pray with and support those to be anointed. Each sacrament, every sacrament, is meant to be something celebrated with the community. That's why they took baptism out of being something individual and private and moved it to a communal experience so that the church or those gathered could witness this child that has now become a member of Christ's body. Let me conclude this talk by addressing a question that some people often ask me. Does God always heal? Am I going to experience total <coughs> healing in this sacrament? Primarily, what you're being strengthened for is courage and hope and patience and an openness to allow God to be with you always. Today, some Christians tend to go to extremes in their expectation of divine healing. On one hand, some say that if a Christian is not healed of all his diseases, that reflects their lack of faith. Others claim that divine healings were only during the apostolic age when Jesus sent out the apostles when all diseases were healed instantly and automatically. But that's not true. Because the apostles came back from one mission and they were shocked to discover that they didn't have any healings. And some others in the group were creating healings and they were wondering, how is it possible that they get to heal, they're not even apostles, and we didn't get one healing? Well, Jesus was deflating their egos and making them realize that God works through everyone. And this special gift wasn't just theirs. But these two extremes are wrong. God does not always heal the physical infirmities that afflict us. Paul preached to the Galatians when he was going through terrible body, bodily sickness. And he also mentions that he had to leave one of his preaching companions in the town of Miletus because he was too sick to travel. And in his final letter to Timothy, Paul urges his young protege, Barnabas, to no longer drink only water, but to use the little wine for the sake of your stu stomach and your frequent ailments. So this last passage is very informative. Not only does it reveal that illnesses may not always be healed in the apostolic age, 
but it also shows an apostle's practical advice to a fellow Christian who has to deal with their own illness. Notice that Paul does not tell Timothy to pray harder and have more faith that God will heal him from his stomach ailment. Rather, he tells him how to manage the illness through medical means. Some people argue that healings are always instantaneous and were only for those living during the apostolic age, but that afterward, the gift disappeared. The problem with that theory is the Bible tells us otherwise. And I just gave you a good example of the apostles who didn't succeed in their second missing. For example, when Jesus healed the blind man at the pool of Bethsaida, he laid his hands upon him once, and he didn't still see clearly. So he had to lay his hands on him again for that healing to be complete. Finally, we have a standing command in the New Testament in James, which you heard. Is there anyone sick among you? Let them call for the priest. This command is never revoked anywhere in the Bible. Never revoked. And there are no statements anywhere that God will cease to heal. Thus, the command is in effect to this very day. Of course, our healing, like all things, it's subject to God's will. It's subject to God's will. As James pointed out just an early chapter earlier, you do not know about tomorrow. What is your life? For you are in the midst that appears for a little time, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. We have a promise of healing, but not an unqualified one. It is conditional on the will of God. So why isn't it always his will to do so? One answer to the question is in the spiritual discipline and training that can result from facing an illness and adversity. There is, there is a blessing, believe it or not, a discipline that can come. Scripture says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what child is there whom his father does not discipline? For the moment, all discipline is seen painful rather than pleasant. Later it yields to peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. To those who have been trained by it. God often permits these trials for our sanctification. So I firmly believe when I go to anoint someone who has suffered a great deal because of the sacrament and who has asked a priest to come out of faith to be anointed and who are conscious that they are dying and that it's imminent, I tell them, you have suffered and by your suffering you have been sanctified. Trust with all your heart that God will come and take you to his home. You have endured your suffering patiently and lovingly. Have no fear. God is here. I firmly believe that. Paul was afflicted. He kept praying to God that God would remove an angel of Satan who was afflicting him. And then he writes, and to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. And believe it or not, God uses our sufferings to help others. If Paul had not become ill while on his first missionary journey and been forced to stop traveling, he would never have preached to the Galatians and created the first Christian community there. He writes, you know it's because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you first. God used Paul's illness to bring salvation to the Galatians and to bring us the work of scripture through which we still receive benefits from God. This is just one example of God using suffering to bring about good. 
I don't know about you, but so many times I have been deeply affected by someone else's suffering and by their faith. It has, it has made me so much more conscious of the beauty and the sanctification that comes to people who endure their sufferings patiently and allow themselves to be blessed by God in other ways. Therefore, if we suffer, we should look upon it as an opportunity for good, such as by offering up our sufferings for our sanctification and for our departed brothers and sisters in Christ. So, let me conclude by saying this sacrament of the anointing is really a beautiful sacrament. And I encourage any of you that if you are sick and if you are seriously ill and you need the sacrament, call the priest or go to the anointing services that might be offered by the parish. They can be extremely beautiful especially if it's done with the community, because you can feel the power of those who are present and God working through them for you. Okay? That's my talk. <laughs> I will never talk more than 40, 35 minutes. <laughs> you come in the fall again? Yes. Good. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you're my, I love coming. I know you do. It's just so lovely. And, and you're such a wonderful crowd, so it's really a pleasure. Besides, coming up in the fall, I drive up to Boston, and then I drive from Boston to here, and in the early morning in the fall, it's just breathtaking. So it's my only chance to really see the fall of New England, so great. Any questions that people might have? Clarifications? Misunderstandings? Doubts? Yes? Why did the sacrament begin to be used only in extreme cases? You said there was a change. You know, I, you know, I can't really say, but I will say the Middle Ages were tumultuous times. And there were several heresies in the church. So for a long time in the church, people were denied communion. Only special people could receive communion. And so for a long time, and, and believe me, communion wasn't every week either. It was once a month or even once a year. So, so it, over time, the church began to realize how important the sacrament of communion was. All the sacraments are important. But they figured that, oh, well, this sacrament, it only needs to use of the person's near death. But it wasn't just for someone dying. It was meant to be for the sick. Just, just our human error, that's all. Yes? So, Father, if I understand, one, there need not be any formal confession. Confession is part one that's correct. of all the... His or her sin. That's correct. At that anointing, yes. Okay. So the priest, the priest doesn't have the sacrament of penance beforehand. But this is what some people think is like sliding through the back door. Oh, I think I'll go get anointed because I haven't been to confession in months. That's not the right thing. But yes, it, it, the sins are forgiven them. Okay. And especially when you're in the hospital and someone's really ill. Um, they have a choice if they, you know, some go, may I go to confession? Absolutely. But they don't need to go. They have to believe in the power of God's mercy. That's nice, isn't it? Beautiful. I'm just worried that I'm not going to get it when I want it. <laughs> That's why people don't always confess because there's a group of people around. Right, right, right. Yeah. But you know, the early church, you everyone knew your sins. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the early the catechumens confessed publicly before they were actually brought into the church fully. Once they came into the church, confession wasn't every week yet, otherwise they, they were expected to change their lives. It's, it's fascinating, you church history and how, how we have evolved to what we have today. It's really wonderful. Yes? So I have, um, when my dad was dying, he was unconscious, and I called a priest in, and they did the I can't remember, I was kind of a traumatizing time, sure. what he said, but um, 
I do remember one thing, and because he was unconscious, he said something to him like, are you sorry for all your sins? And he didn't really respond, and he said, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> so well, then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, maybe that wasn't valid, because he didn't respond, I mean, what? No, what no, was no, so you must, you really have to, what would that person have responded? I, he didn't have the faith. Hmm. He did as when he was younger, but he kind of went away. As many do. As many do. But but I, you know it's far better to, to assume or presume the goodness of a person rather than to think because at at the moment of death many people are filled with remorse mm -hmm. and regret, mm -hmm. and so I I would have that you can't anoint someone who has died though. No, no, I was going to say, but you can't, the anointing is not for those who have died. That's when you do a special blessing. So you do a special blessing. What's that? Special blessing? Yeah, well, you have a special prayers for those who have died. Father? Yes. We, we pray now and at the hour of our death. Have you experienced hour of our death special incidents or? For myself. Well, that's a you know that's my favorite. I I love the Hail Mary, precisely for that reason. We're asking Our Lady to intercede this moment now because right now this is the most important moment. This is your day today, so help me today by the power of your intercession. Show me Christ, lead me, and Mary has always, according to Saint Alphonsus, been one who is our intercessor and advocate at the moment of death. So. St. Alphonsus says, if you have devotion to Mary, you can be guaranteed that at the moment of your death, she's interceding for you. That she will bring you to her son. So I haven't had any life, um, you know, threatening moments. But I have been at moments where people who are, di are dying and have completely come to God. Completely. I, I, I have had people, I've gone into, you know, Hospitals with corporate businessmen with all sorts of money who wasted their lives, you know, lived very, you know, um, rugged lives, gave them the sacrament anointing. And the next thing I know, they've changed their will. Not for the church, but they've, they've decided, <laughs> I want to have a Catholic Mass, I want to be buried in the Catholic Church. Because God can work miracles at any moment. But it's, a, you know, it's so important. It's so important with any sacrament that you, as a priest, that you never treat any sacrament as simply um, something you have to do. Every person has to be treated as they are, where they are, and who they are. So you have to be, you have to be as present to this person as Jesus is. So when I go into a hospital, I, I want to get rid of just the, you know, the, the hospital setting, make it feel like it's antiseptic, like I'm just in there, like the nurse giving the medication. I'm here for them, and I'll stay as long as the family wants me to. But it's so important that every, even the Eucharist, even the Eucharist as a priest, when I'm giving the Eucharist to every person that comes up, I am not just body of Christ, body isn't, isn't just, it's not just a function for me. I'm conscious of people's hands. I see people's hands sometimes, and they show me they've worked hard, they've suffered. I see arthritic hands, I see broken hands, but I'm so conscious of who I'm giving it to, even if it's a split second. When I'm saying these words, I believe it, and I hope you do too. It's so important. And never to take a side, well, I'm going to get this over with. I got mass today. <coughs> Many uh, years ago, I was a friend of mine's mother died. Well, she was in a coma for a period of time. And another friend said, well, isn't it too bad we just can't push a button and get this over with? Mm -hmm. And she was Catholic. And right. I was kind of shocked. And I said to her, but we don't know what goes on in that person's soul when they're in a coma. And God may be working out some great things with that person. And maybe this period of time of being in a coma is God's way of giving them that grace that they need to get to the next Absolutely. place. Absolutely. You don't know if that person's going to come out of that coma. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's, I mean, that, right. that happens quite often. 
you know. They induce comas for people. And they've been in that coma for, you know, two or three weeks, and then they take them off the respirator and they come back. Yes? No, I heard a priest once say that the, that this sacrament is so powerful that it can remit all temporal punishment. Is there any, in the next war, like purgatory, is there anything to that? Is there, he was saying like you, that this is, we've just, we don't pay enough attention to the sacrament, how powerful it is. Is there anything to that? I, I can't say I know for sure. Okay. My greatest hope, and you know, at the end of the rosary we say, Jesus have mercy on me and help all souls to get to heaven, especially those most in need of your mercy. Yes. So mercy is the, is the key word for me, mercy. Mm -hmm. And that, that covers a lot of bases. Mm -hmm. But I, I just don't, I can't say, and okay. I'm sorry I didn't research it enough to be okay. able to. So I don't want to make any mistakes. By the way, who are you showing this film to? <laughs> Show it to the bishop. <laughs> no, but I, you know, um, when I was first ordained, I memorized this, and I always hold by this, but with every sacrament. So, priest of God, say this Mass as if it were your first Mass. Say this Mass as if it were your only Mass. Say this Mass as if it were your last Mass. So whenever I celebrate the sacraments, I'm always conscious of this is the moment. What you do in this sacrament is going to affect this person's life. And hopefully they're going to meet Jesus and experience the power of God's love. That's so important. So, and any of you who are Eucharistic ministers or lectors of the Word, you should see that responsibility of proclaiming the word is a tremendous gift that you've been given, and you should cherish it, and you should practice it. And if you are a Eucharistic minister, you should approach the people you give the Eucharist to, this is a sacrament, this is life-giving, and you've been commissioned and blessed to give this Eucharist to another. And you need to see this as a very special office. Not only that you're helping the church, but you're actually, your smile. For God's sake, smile. <laughs> people are so serious. <laughs> I say to people, you know, I'm really sad. We got rid of all the statues, but I'm not sad because they're all on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> I, uh, yes? I find when I bring communion to the hospital, um, I can't help but touch them. Mm. I want to touch them. And yes. I, I think they feel alone and scared, so I think it's just the desire I have. I absolutely. touch their leg or their hand or something just to... I think that's wonderful. <coughs> I absolutely think it's ab beautiful. Yes, like power of touch. Mm -hmm. I was going to tell you... Um, <laughs> this is just a funny story. Uh, when I was newly ordained, I was sent to the hospital and when I arrived there, the nurse station said to me, Oh, Father, I'm so happy you came. There's a sweet little nun down at the end of the hall. Do you know this story? Yeah. No. She's a sweet little nun down at the end of the hall. She, I think she wants to go to confession. So, like, this was going to be my first confession. So, and, and a nun, no less. Oh, oh my God. So, <laughs> I go the, so I go down in the room and I go in there, and it's a Polish nun. Oh. <laughs> and she's got the little white cap on, you know. She's lying there in the bed, and so I'm standing at the end of the bed, and I said, Good morning, sister. How are you? And she goes, well, with a real gruff tone, like, Come closer. <laughs> <laughs> so I move to the middle of the bed, and I go, Good morning, sister. How are you today? She goes, Come closer. <laughs> so she really does funny questions. So I take out the stole, and put it, and I go, God bless you, sister. She goes, come closer. So I goes, this is a real private confession. So I bend down and go, God bless you, sister. And she goes, the bedpan. Get the bedpan. <laughs> so anyways, I, if there are no more questions, and these two wonderful little boys in this wonderful family, my gosh, yes. In other words, 
you know, you're just not standing around. And we have to be by ourselves. We can't even get to church. Maybe we can't even get communion. Can we call on the saints and, and just, will they intercede as well as the mother? Oh, actually, oh, I mean, that's their job. It, no, seriously, their job. And, and, and just say, I need anointing or I need help or, or you know, I, I'm sitting and, or I'm sitting and um, I don't know what to do. I want to get it off and, you know, I have to go on with life. And it, it's almost like a confession. Sort of. Well, I would, I do all of that, honestly, in your prayer. I would, I would first of all lament. Okay, that's that's in a very important component of the spiritual life. It's it's laced throughout the Psalms, lamenting. So you have to stop lamenting and assuming. Well, that's right. Well, that, the, the beauty of a lament, if you do, if you are attentive to whom you're praying to, the grace of God. He seeks through, and at the end of every lament in the psalm, they suddenly become aware that they're not alone. And they come to the conclusion that God is their help and their hope. So suddenly they regain their hope, which wasn't with them when they began. But because they expressed their sorrow and their sadness and their frustration, they felt as if they were heard, and suddenly they feel hope again. And the other important thing is, when I, you know, I got, I got stuck in Spain, for um, nine days because I tested positive the day before I was supposed to go home. So I couldn't, I couldn't get on the plane and go home. So suddenly I was a tourist for, for 12 days and now I'm a prisoner. And actually at the bottom of the airport it said, leave this airport immediately. And so I felt like I was being cast out. But I was so, I was so frazzled. I just couldn't believe that here I was in a foreign land. And I, I mean, I had money, but I didn't know where to go. I mean, they didn't say, well, there's a hotel down the street that takes care of some people like you. So, I mean, I had to find a hotel and all that. And so I was getting, and then I was getting really frustrated because I had two retreats I was supposed to give, and suddenly all that was going out the window. So all my anxieties were coming front and forward. And I was just, I was so upset. And that night, I, I suddenly realized, well, I, I, I left something out of the picture, and I left God out of the picture. And I said, so who can help me to understand what I'm going through? And then I thought about Joseph and Mary and their flight to Egypt. And then I thought about a beautiful statue in the National Shrine of the flight to Egypt, a gorgeous sculpture. And it has Mary sitting in the sun. Joseph is asleep. The, whore, the donkey's asleep. The baby's in her arms. And her face, which is has this sheen on it from sweat. It's just gazing toward heaven. So I said to myself, you forgot the important ingredient. You're not alone. <laughs> and you need to call on the one who loves you and say, trust that this is all going to unfold and everything's going to be go well. And it did. But it took me a whole day to come to that awareness. <laughs> so I think you, there's a whole loving trust is a very important component. So. You should pray and ask, please provide an opportunity for me in which I can receive this sacrament, whichever it is you want. But pray for the, pray for the moment. I guarantee you it will come. It doesn't always come when you want it. Mm -hmm. So they often say, you may not get what you want because of the way you want it. But trust that it will come, and it will. You need to be surprised. That's what I love. You really do. It's a beautiful thing when you're surprised by God. Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, have you ever had to like deal with like people like with anointing the sick, like who have like autism or like serious like absolutely? Needs? Yeah, autistic uh, people. I've dealt with uh, mentally handicapped autistic people. Again, you you have to be really attentive and be sensitive to their disability. Yeah. And very respectful. Yeah. So you can't expect them to respond to you the way someone is who's used to the sacrament and knows what they're supposed to That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's you're the one who has been given the power to give them the gift. And so you work with what you have, trusting that God will work through that. Yeah. That's so important. Yeah, because I actually like have autism, and I think that it's kind of more like just a social barrier more. Yes, yes, it's sure. It's more like, you know, like sometimes like communicating with people and stuff like that. And God like, bless you, huh? But you're also gifted, you know. Mm -hmm. You are. 
autistic people are gifted, mm -hmm. and we f we fail to forget that, and they're, they're amazing in terms of what what they do know and what they see. So, God bless you. Yes. We bring communion to um, a nursing home uh, weekly. <clears throat> a lot of times when we give communion to a person, you know, they'll pray along with us and all that and then <clears throat> take the communion. And before they sometimes, well, they swallow it or they still have it in their mouth and they start speaking about something totally unrelated right. to communion. And it's I, I never quite know, uh, because I know I cannot reprimand them or anything, but I usually, I, sometimes I try to, to say, let's say a Hail Mary, or let's do this, but they sometimes... And always make sure you guide their hands, hands, guide them to take their hand and guide them to take the communion, if mm. you can do that first. Okay. So just say, let me help you, because they're confused too. Right. And they're, so just take their hand and lean it toward their mouth and tell them to eat it, mm. to eat it. Okay, that's so important. Mm -hmm. If they can't, then take the communion and put it off to the side. I know, okay. yeah, I, I, I do that. But and they, also to pray with them, yes. They, they take it, but then there, there is, it seems that there is no connection between what they take mm -hmm. and what they say. Right, right, again. There's a disability there in right. just their mental capacity to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how many people you go to have dementia. Oh, a lot of them. Yeah. I used to work there, so I know a lot of these people have dementia. And I, most of the time, I know how to deal with them. But it, it uh, sometimes I, I feel I should be able to do something more to keep them more aware that uh, what they received. I, I don't think you're going to succeed. <laughs> Not to be unkind, but I don't, just because of their mental capacity. So to be, just be conscious of that. And so, but you're aiding them and allowing the sacrament to do the rest of the work. Okay, so if they can take it and eat it, that's fine. All right. It's food for the way. Okay. Very important. Thank you. Um, I just want to let, share one last story with you. Uh, you know, last week was uh, the, the feast of the body and blood of Christ, and it brought to mind this wonderful story. Um, my, when I was five years old, six years old, my grandmother, my father's mother, came to visit us in Virginia, and she came from Texas, and she was in her 80s, and she, she, she embodied, you know, an elderly woman. She had a black dress on, and she had this little black cap, and she was as sweet as could be. She had a little black purse, you know. And so um, so we couldn't do much with her because she was fragile, so she couldn't play tag. <laughs> also, she didn't play board games like Monopoly. So one day I said, Grandma, would you like to play mass? Well, she was a Methodist. And so she looked at me and said, well, what did we do? And I said, oh, well, we go out in the garage, and we set up church in the garage. And all you have to do is sit with my little sister Vicky with her dolls because we're going to baptize the baby soon. <laughs> and then I said, and you can pick the hymn. So I gave her this hymnal. Well, she, she said, where's, um, you know, where's, where's uh, this particular hymn? What was it she wanted? Um, it was a Protestant hymn. And I just said, Grandma, this is a Catholic hymnal. So none of the hymns that you know are in this hymnal. And then she said, oh, I do know this one. The church is one foundation. I said, great, we'll use that. So then, so then we, and then she said, I said, so this is, we set up the altar. We took a little, just a little TV tray and we put, a, you know, a towel over it. And then I took the globe from my room and I put that down. And then I put another towel over that. And I said, so Grandma, this is the tabernacle and this is the altar, okay? And she said, well, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. And I go, when in Rome? I said, this is Virginia. <laughs> so, so anyways, we, we, um, we said the Mass. And, you know, now, here's the funny part. My oldest sister, Margaret, she was in charge of all the younger ones during the summer. So she governed us. She was really our governess. And so whatever she said, we did. 
And so she decided she was going to say the Mass. So she put on the vestments that I made out of oilcloth, and I had a red electrical tape going down and making a cross. And then for a surplus, I wore my father's navy undershirt, because he was so big and it was perfect. So we said the Mass. Now, we, the Grandma says, I said, my sister said to me, would you go and prepare the Eucharist? So I went into the kitchen, and I cut out, out of Wonder Bread, with a, with a cap of a peanut butter jar, host. And then I took made Kool-Aid, and then I soaked the host in the Kool-Aid. So my sister said, what are you doing? This isn't, this isn't the way we receive communion. Where did you get that idea? We said, well, Monsignor Myers at church at Blessed Sacrament on Sundays, I see him with, with that ciborium, and he, take, you know, he always taps the side, and I always thought there was blood of Christ dripping back into the suborium. She goes, no, he's dropping crumbs. You know? So I said, oh, I thought that. She said, go back and prepare it again. So I had to go back and make a whole new batch of hosts with Kool-Aid. And this Monsignor Myers, the parish we were in was Blessed Sacrament, and he would ride around the neighborhood on his bike with a suit on, a black suit and a clerical, and white gloves. I, this is the optional story. <laughs> so it was such a different church then. But anyways, my grandmother was so sweet. She sat there through the whole Mass. My sister gave communion to herself and to my sister Laura because my sister and I, Vicky and I, had not received the sacrament. And Grandma didn't get it either. <laughs> but, I, but I said to her, don't you worry, Grandma. I know that you see Jesus just like we do. And she was so sweet. I just love that idea of making our grandmother play Mass. <laughs> so listen, all of you, you have to go. Well, you don't have to go, but I want, <laughs> I want you to be able to free to go. So, so I'll give you a blessing, OK? Yes. And I'm going to go see Susan Zimmerman now and anoint her, so. For the intercession of Mary, our mother perpetual help, may this blessing of Almighty God come to each of you, so that it may embrace you, especially on this feast of John the Baptist, that you may be charged with the fire of God's love, to truly embrace your calling as a Christian, one baptized in the faith, and to become one who works at pointing to Jesus and less at yourself and others. May the Lord protect you from all harm and injury and continue to enable you to become the community that Christ envisions for you. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Father. Thank you.